we should get to the OBS. But once you figure out all the back end, technology is just such an awesome thing. Mm-hmm. Oh, I've already, I'm already hearing you from the Twitch channel. Oh, awesome. Just uh, make sure everything is... Okay, I can see us on on LinkedIn. Give it a second for YouTube. It's always uh, a little bit tricky for some reason let's see here yeah that's not a problem there were so there were a variety of people i promised to tag on linkedin so they would know when we go live and i am going to re-pull up that list Hey, Preston, I can see you in the comments. Um, and I am struggling to comment on my own post. This is perfect. Okay, I think I've got YouTube figured out. I see you on Twitch. I don't see the comments for Twitch, though. Okay, there we go. Looks like people are seeing us on YouTube as well. Very good. Okay. What do you think, Dave? Are we are we ready to begin? We are almost ready to begin. I promised to tag a handful of people on LinkedIn, and I, for whatever reason, cannot get to my own stream on LinkedIn, which is about par for the course, right, Vlad? Okay. Yeah. It's just taking a minute to get there. Okay. So who do we got? Okay. We got Preston. I see you. Let's see. Let's see. I promised to tag Sean. Oh, it looks like in the stream, it's just you with the, with the tag. Oh, it's because you have it set to whoever's speaking. I think oh, okay. you're able to set the view to, um, gallery mode top uh top right of your okay. zoom setting we were in gallery mode shortly before this i'm gonna stop the screen share and let everyone uh get a chance to uh to get in see if that uh changes it yeah that works Very good. Uh, so I guess the one bad thing of when you ask people to let you know uh, if they want to be tagged when you go live and then a bunch of people say yes and then you start your live stream tagging people. Oh, it's true because you gotta do it one by one. I guess there's no way to notify, but I think they get a notification once you go live. I think they do, but I have found that LinkedIn is a little weird. Fair enough. Okay. We're getting a thumbs up on YouTube. So for those who are just oh, uh, joining good. up, where oh man, there's people from Algeria. It's really cool. No, very good. Okay, I think I have hit everyone who has asked us to do that. I think that we should uh, we should be live. I think everyone is saying that we are we are live. So thank you, everyone who can see and hear us and uh, and has joined in already. Good. Very good. Okay. 
So okay. um, I'll kick it off with a quick introduction. So myself and Dave have uh, begun this uh, live stream venture slash podcast, depending on where you're listening to this last year. And this is installment number two of the uh, of the stream slash podcast. And so today the topic is going to be focused on careers in the manufacturing industry. And that includes education, that includes different paths, different uh, levels of careers, how to progress, how to apply to jobs. And of course, there's going to be a lot of things that we can expand upon, but we're going to try and keep it under the typical 45 minute limit, Dave. And, yes. uh, you know, there's for sure going to be a follow up and we've got uh, guest speakers who are probably going to join in on this topic who are even more experienced in the industry. But we're going to give you our perspective. Uh, with that being said, Dave, I want to kick it off with a very or somewhat controversial question, uh, mm -hmm. which is education uh, and background to get into manufacturing, you know, getting a degree versus learning on your own. But at the same time, I still want to hear a little bit on how you got into the industry. And we talked a little bit about that last episode, but, you know, just give us a little summary and what are your thoughts on degree versus self-thought? Yeah. So I think that that's a really good question, uh, Vlad. And I kind of go back and forth on education and to give everyone the slightly more well-rounded version of education. Um, I, I went to the, the normal four-year college that honestly was, it was, it was not right for me when I was 18. So I ended up going to tech school. I got my airframe and power plant certifications um, to be able to go work on airplanes, which is where a lot of my technical background and a lot of my troubleshooting skills come from. And then kind of based upon where the aviation industry was and the job options and what I wanted to do after a short period of time doing that, I ended up going back to school, getting an associate's and then a bachelor's degree. And I would say that uh, especially in this industry, tech school for me uh, provided some of the best value um, uh, I would say tech school provided some of the best value, uh, some of the best hands-on experience. And um, I'm going to let you go into it a little bit, Vlad, and we can kind of continue the conversation. But I would say kind of when you're looking to break into the industry, getting kind of any sort of that hands-on experience in that real life environment is, is one of the hardest things to do and the hardest parts of actually getting a, a real paying job. Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, you hit it right on the head, especially towards the end there by saying that real life experience, I think, is extremely important. And, um, you know, my perspective on the entire like education versus self thought is, um, I guess I'll premise that with kind of a, a bias that I have. I've also gone to a traditional university and I've gotten my bachelor's in electrical engineering. But uh, in my experience, at least manufacturing was not as prevalent as part of that degree. So I've gotten a very general electrical engineering um, knowledge, but I've never actually, I didn't even know what a PLC was once I had graduated. And I felt that once I joined the industry, and again, I didn't specifically target manufacturing after graduation, I had very little uh, applicable skills um, as I got my first job. So it's, um, how to say, it's a bittersweet feeling because had I known that that's how the university was structured and if I really targeted manufacturing, I thought I think I would have chosen a very different path, uh, which could be either like one of the technical engineering programs that pair a lot of the kind of in the field work as well as, you know, in-class learning. And then you have a lot of opportunities where you can become, let's say, a certified electrician while you work, while you're doing your hours um, after your full-time job. And I think that's, for me at least, like looking back, that would be a much better entryway into manufacturing. And again, like I'm only talking about controls. There's a lot of different, there's a broad array of, uh, of jobs. But when it comes to controls and engineering, I think there were like better paths. And uh, I could, if I relate that back a little bit, would be because of like, I guess, financial gain, because you become a lot more financially stable quicker and you can start earning as you, you know, pursue some of those other uh, learning opportunities. But that's, uh, that's kind of how I feel. There's definitely a lot of different angles to that. I think that traditional education still brings um, an immense value. And um, I guess there's 
many aspects to that, but one of which is that employers, in my mind, are still looking for those degrees because if you look at it from from the employer standpoint, it's just an easy way to uh, to filter people. And by no means uh, a self-taught person would ever be worse at a certain skill than the one that has a degree, but it's just a very easy way to, you know, if you've got uh, hundreds or thousands of applicants to filter through them. And that's the unfortunate, I think, reality of uh, screening candidates. No, no, I, I would completely agree with that. And I think that brings up a really good point. I, I certainly thought a lot about this in the early 2000s when I was considering kind of the path of going to college and then going back to college. And especially after like the 2008 crisis, financial crisis, we see a lot of people have gone to college and many jobs are asking for a bare minimum of a bachelor's degree. Uh, I, I've got a good friend, Mike, who went to work as a customer service representative at Yahoo. Um, complete change in his career. He was a computer science engineer, decided to do something different. And their bare minimum requirement was something like a bachelor's degree with like a 3.6 GPA. And they were filtering all candidates based specifically off of those. And so mm -hmm. I, I would agree with what you're saying, Vlad. I, I think that when you look at all of this, you have to look at where you are on your career. And sometimes the concept of going to school to get a degree, that piece of paper is like the entry cost into, uh, into the career field. Uh, I would also agree with what you were saying. Uh, so kind of like the, that technical side of engineering, I, I hear them called co-ops a lot, at least in mm -hmm. the United States. Um, and those are typically like five or six year degrees. And at least one of those one of those years is you're out working in the field. And I've uh, only heard good things from people who have gone down the process of, uh, of getting their co-op degree. And then uh, when you were talking about the electrician and being able to go be an electrician, uh, I would say that I have found that that varies and potentially very widely uh, state to state and especially country to country. And the way people, the people in the US that are listening, it may be different from to Canada. And from what I understand, it's, it's very different across Europe. But I would agree that there is certainly a good opportunity to go and if you decide you want to be in manufacturing, if you decide you want to be in controls, getting more of that hands-on experience, as I mentioned, that hands-on experience has served me well, even when I spend very little, if any part of my year, uh, actually working on, uh, on machinery at this point. Yeah, no, I mean, it's... Uh... Like I was saying, it's a little bit uh, bittersweet that I hadn't known about all of these opportunities, you know, when I was younger. And to be mm -hmm. quite honest with you, I was fairly lost when it came to career planning. And of course, you know, universities offer and even colleges or high schools offer a wide range of services where they try and kind of direct you towards something and mentor mm -hmm. you maybe or explain certain things. But I had absolutely no idea. Um, you know, what manufacturing had to offer. And I think if I would have known mm -hmm. that and had maybe a mentor from the field, I would have been a lot better positioned to um, to get in some of these jobs. But I mean, that being said, I think, like I said, like the education system is very different, I find, for manufacturing um, in general. Like I said, my degree didn't cover any of the materials or gave me any exposure except the just the general electrical engineering knowledge, which, of course, helps mm -hmm. me in a certain way. You know, I notice certain mm -hmm. things maybe a little bit differently, but I've never studied uh, ladder logic programming. I've never studied function blocks. You know, that was all completely new to me. I had never seen, like I was saying, a, uh, a control or anything of that sort. But um, that being said, uh, I want to ask you what, uh, what you believe maybe are some of the, um, so three key areas, you know, so moving forward, I guess, if you are in manufacturing and if you want to focus on controls or just give us a, a general thought that you may have, what would be kind of like very hands-on applicable skills that you're seeing in the next, you know, two to five years employers um, heavily looking for, and it could be soft or hard skills, whatever. Makes yeah. Sense. So I, I would say like, like, let me pick, let me pick a soft skill. Let me pick a hard skill and, uh, and let me kind of continue to move on with that. I, I would say, 
everywhere, in, including uh, manufacturing and maybe very specifically manufacturing, kind of the soft skill of communication and being able to communicate with different people. Um, I, I think that's becoming more and more necessary. And I think especially in now 2021, uh, you know, we, we've gone through this pandemic, remote work is becoming such more prevalent, the opportunities to remote to work remotely with various experts around the world in manufacturing is becoming more and more prevalent and readily accepted. And I would say that that is and, and the ability to have communication across a variety of of different platforms is important. Whether you're in person, face-to-face, -face, or you're picking up the phone, or you're typing, it's kind of that stretch that we all find ourselves having to go through. Um, I would say, you know, finding a way to communicate and work collaboratively with people. Um, and then I would say kind of that, that second hard skill, or maybe less of a hard skill, but more of a, the, the, the way you get to it is hard, is kind of sitting down and figuring out where you are and where you want to be and kind of focusing in on one thing in particular. You know, if you want to work on PLCs and controls, you know, you could, as everyone can see behind you who are watching us live, Vlad, you know, you could work on you know the Allen Bradley and you could be a absolute master in the Allen Bradley suite but you may not have any idea what code assist looks like and you may not have any idea what Siemens looks like because they're all at least slightly different so if you want to work on controls and you want to work on PLCs focus on expanding your skills so it's not just all Allen Bradley or not all just Siemens or not all just Codasys because that variety of skill within your chosen niche is going to become more and more important. I think moving forward in the next series of years, we are certainly going to see more people willing to change platforms, more people willing to kind of expand. Uh, and, you know, based upon all of the projections, you know, there, there should be a fair amount of growth and spend in this industry. And so figuring out what you want to do and then finding a way to set yourself up for success um, in that. And then I would say the, the third thing is, uh, wow. That's a good one. I would say the third thing is, is be flexible and understand kind of where you are and be willing to take some risks, uh, especially if you're new or in the middle of your career. If a good opportunity comes up that looks like it's a good opportunity, you shouldn't limit yourself to just one facility or just one vertical. Um, there are times when you know, oil and gas may be up and the money is good in that. And there are other times where energy, where, you know, solar may be up or food and beverage. If you can kind of expand your verticals and your, your product knowledge, it, you will be much less likely to be out of work in the future. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree. I think that's uh, diversifying, right. As even mm -hmm. a, they would call it in the financial terms is extremely important. Um, while, you were making your point. We got very interesting questions uh, from our YouTube channel. So I'm going to read them in order as they came in. Okay. And let's see if we can elaborate a little bit. So Bilal said that he's graduated this year from automation information and uh, information industrial systems. And he's got a similar problem with uh, practical industrial experience. And I'm thinking that he's probably wondering what could be um, you know, our advice, and if I may kind of start answering that and feel free to chime in, Dave, is that um, if I was in, in those shoes, and again, I was exactly there in 2013 where I had graduated, I had very little uh, practical experience. I had done one internship. So one single summer out of the, uh, out of the three summers of my four-year education that I got to work as an, as an electrical engineer intern. But uh, as I graduated, what I had done is I, I just started applying to every single opportunity, obviously, within the field and closely related to electrical engineering. And uh, my first job, like to be quite honest with you, I may have mentioned it in the previous episode, was not extremely glamorous. I became a field engineer for uh, Mitsubishi Electric, and I would go out and diagnose problems in elevator and escalator systems. And then I would, you know, spec out wire harnesses and figure out 
you know, what kind of issues the mechanics and electricians would encounter during installation or service calls. And so what that allowed me to do is start gaining that industry experience. Again, it was not programming. It was not designing big systems. It was literally just troubleshooting and understanding what's going on. But as I gained that knowledge, I was able to, you know, continue to apply and continue to understand everything. And once I got to the next interviews, I was able to speak a lot better to, um, to, to you know, what I had done and some of the projects I had completed. And it allowed me to transition into a better job. So I think to summarize that, at least in the uh, culture that I was in, you know, get something that you can start learning from. And then if you're looking to move up, if it's not something that you think is the end goal, start, uh, you know, applying that experience, gain knowledge, and then trans transition into something else. Yeah, no, I would say that, that that's a really good, uh, I would say that's a really good piece of advice, Vlad. Um, and again, kind of that getting the, ex once you have any experience in the industry, it it's much easier to move up. The mm -hmm. hardest part is kind of getting that first piece of experience. That's um, right. And I, I see a lot of people like you were talking to applying, you know, to a variety of places. And I would say one thing that I commend kind of that initial push into was you didn't come in saying, hey, I am a degreed electrical engineer. I have to have, you know, electrical engineer in my title. You took a job as like a field service technician engineer out in the field learning learning the actual skills of the trade. And so um, the kind of my advice along that is twofold, be honest with yourself and be willing to kind of take and look and accept a less than glamorous job title yep. in order to help kind of kickstart your career. And in six months or a year, you can either move internally in that company, either up the ladder or a year from that point, you're going to be much more, you're going to be looked at much better than the next graduating class who doesn't have any experience and you've spent a year in the industry. Um, the, the one other piece of advice that I like to give people is as opposed to just, you know, sending resumes, if there are systems integrators, if there are, you know, facilities that you're interested in going to work, especially if you already live in that area, you know, go figure out who's in charge of that department or who's in charge of hiring and go and, and, you know, reach out to them and ask them what you need to do to get hired. Say, Hey, I'm interested to get into the industry. I am interested to, you know, work for this company in this type of position. What, this is where I'm at. Can you help me understand what I need to do to get hired? And then you'll at least have a path to get hired. And that is kind of like that best instantaneous feedback loop where you should not expect all of these people are going to hire you. But if you can have a couple of conversations, they can at least help put you down the right path to what they actually look for to hire a new person. Yeah, that's a, again, good point. And I think I wish I would have taken your advice back in 2013, because uh, my process was very traditional. I've never, um, I guess the skill of networking was not mm -hmm. as apparent to me at the time. So I purely applied on the websites. Mm -hmm. I didn't reach out to anyone. I just sent out resume after resume. And it took me a long time. I graduated, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly, as of um, mid to late April of that year. And I think I've actually started working in October, if not November. So it took me quite a bit of time, you know, to prep the CVs, go through the interview mm -hmm. process. And of course there's multiple stages mm -hmm. and uh, find my first placement. So I think that's one thing that people are always nervous about. And mm -hmm. I can assure you that you will be nervous, but you just have to persevere. You have to keep applying. Um, like Dave was saying, you should definitely look in a broader scope. But at the same time, I would also say, don't necessarily pigeonhole yourself into doing something that's not that's completely out of your field, right? So you can certainly, if you have needs to finance, um, you know, your family, your living expenses, that's like one thing. But if you're able to hold on and kind of get at least in the, uh, in the industry, that's extremely important, because it takes a lot of time uh, to search for a job. It's almost a full-time job to find a job. So oh, it's, yeah. uh, it's certainly going to be much more difficult if you're, you know, already working 60 hours a week and trying to look for something else. But again, it, it depends on your needs. It depends on your financial uh, situation for sure. Um, we've got a next question. So from Brian, so he, he says, thank you guys. Uh, could you give us a, an opinion about the 
certifications such as CCNA, TUV, and the benefits? Uh, so that's a, a very, very good question because one of my actually three points was going to, well, two of the points was going to be networking and cybersecurity. And the reason for that is because the the line or the metaphorical split between control systems and IT is becoming much more blurred these years. And what I mean by that is once you start configuring your control systems, you need to understand networking because all of the devices, not only the PLC itself, but all of the motors, all of your IO cards that you can see behind me on this side or that side, they all go on the network. And so even a fundamental understanding of the network, I think is going to be a requirement. And uh, it's very typical that I go out to sites of uh, some of my clients and you know the technicians and or electricians that haven't been trained or had zero exposure to something that's covered in the CCNA, the, the two exams, I think they probably have changed it since, uh, since I had studied for it, but I had the really thick books for CCNA. There's like part one, um, I think it was IC and D1 and IC and D2 exam, but I actually took only the first one. So technically I have the CCENT, not the CCNA. Um, but long story short, the certifications are extremely important. And I think it's a very easy way to measure the knowledge of an individual. So if you come in and interview with, uh, with me and you have an interest in PLCs, but you've got a certification from CCNA, I definitely know that you understand networking and you can apply those skills immediately. And I can essentially help you understand how to program PLCs, but on the networking side, it's going to be really clear and you'll have uh, things that you can do right away. So of course, there's a lot of value, I think, in those certifications. And one may argue, you know, if there's a platform that's not necessarily on Cisco, then does CCNA apply? I, I still think it's an industry standard and I think it's free applicable between whatever switches or whatever devices, uh, if it's HP, Cisco, or uh, what is it, Juniper Networks. Uh, that might be in the field. But I, I think it's extremely relevant. I think the uh, security certifications are extre extremely relevant. The uh, the PMP, I guess I, I still have somewhat of uh, some doubts depending on obviously what job you're looking to get. If you're going for project manager in, uh, in the industry, that's going to be very applicable. And uh, I'm not familiar, like I said, with all the certifications, but there are going to be some very, very valuable ones. Yeah, what no, do you no, think? I I, I would agree with that, Vlad. I think certifications are good. Um, kind of as I briefly had mentioned earlier, I think that if you pick an area that you want to work and look at getting some certifications in that, I think that makes a lot of sense. I think that if you go out and you get certified in networking and OT cybersecurity and, you know, your Microsoft service stack and you also go get a bunch of certifications and a bunch of PLCs, uh, and you're, you're going and talking to an employer, the employer is going to ask, you know, what are you interested in? You got all of these certifications. And at some point, the question may be, could you just be really good at studying and taking tests? Mm -hmm. And so I think that if you're interested in those particular areas, the certifications are certainly a bonus. And if you go to start work in those areas, the people are certainly going to understand what those certifications mean. And that is that is definitely a good thing. Uh, similar to like the, the, the PMP or potentially, you know, getting your, your professional engineering uh, license. It, it's one of those like if you're going to work in the industry and that's the particular area that you want to work in, I think that it makes sense to, you know, go down that route. Uh, just as like Vlad was saying, like, if you're looking for a job, it's a full-time job to get a job. And if you're already working 60 hours a week at your job, then, you know, you're working a lot to kind of find the next thing. I think the question always becomes, do I want to push more time into studying for a certificate? Mm -hmm. um, while I'm going through all these processes. But generally, I think cert certificates are good. Um, Vlad, I'm, I'm going to shout out Solus PLC. I'm going to shout out, you know, the other uh, Udemy and the other courses that exist out there, not necessarily at the level um, of the networking and OT cybersecurity certificates, but going through the course and showing that you've done some of these things, uh, especially if you want to learn controls, being able to show projects and other things, also a, a big bonus um, as yep. you're going to look to either break into the industry or you're looking to go from like an electrician to a controls PLC program or something along those. 
Yeah, and I think, um, you know, to your point, I really wish that there was maybe a much more structured certification path in uh, manufacturing and in control specifically. I think that there's a missed opportunity that, um, you know, even Cisco and Amazon with their AWS certification platform recognized, and they're providing that um, not free of charge, of course, but I think the lessons are free of charge, but then you have to pay for the tests. Um, But what that creates is a lot of opportunities for those individuals, and they allow to essentially the AWS model is that you need to have a certain number of techs that are certified at a certain level in order to work in AWS, because at the same time, that strengthens the community, right? So that provides value to the certification. But at the same time, you get people who are knowledgeable with the system that are implementing some of these applications. And so that creates maybe, uh, I would say, like a synergy between the two that uh, combines the technical knowledge and, um, you know, AWS certification path. That being said, in controls, I just I just feel like there's not enough uh, not enough materials, and I think people are slowly creating them on their own. Uh, I think one good example of what I've seen done is from uh, from Ignition, right? So Ignition has a pretty good like university um, that gives you like videos and it walks you through steps, um, and then the certification is actually quite challenging. I don't know if. Uh, You've watched some of those videos, but at the end, you have to create like a full application. You have to troubleshoot applications. And uh, that's, I guess, like one of my plans on the long term with uh, Solus PLC for sure. It's to create something that's a little little bit more tangible that resembles, you know, what uh, Cisco and Amazon have created through their platforms. But uh, the other example, Opto 22, I think they also have a really good university and I hope that they create. And I think they're probably going to work on something similar, but when they certify uh, people on their systems, right? Because they have an extensive library of uh, programming tools that they've showcased with their hardware and software, but they haven't there. I don't believe that they have a certification path at this point. Uh, Yeah, I'm not familiar with the certification path for those guys, but I I think that that's a really good goal. Um, And and I do say that the inductive university uh, Mm -hmm. from the uh, inductive automation folks is kind of like the gold standard if you're looking to, to have and teach someone your platform. Uh, I know a lot of people that, that I have certainly suggested to that in the past, you know, just basics, you know, of SCADA, of, uh, of kind of programming in this area. So, so completely agree with that. Yeah. Speaking of, speaking of which, by the way, SCADA was going to be on my list of things to, uh, to know as well for the next Mm -hmm. five years, because I think that uh, just PLCs in general, you know, standalone PLCs in a, in a machine are becoming a thing of the past. So there's going to be a lot more data that's being passed from from your machinery or from your plant floor in general, up to a concentrated system that's going to be processing all that data and ultimately displaying a full, uh, a full array of different information, not only for the technical folks, but also those who are making decisions in operations, upper management, so on and so forth. So I think that's going to be all fully integrated with all of your MES, ERP systems, and allow you to get a a much better view of your manufacturing process. Because I think ultimately, manufacturing is all about, um, you know, producing something at the lowest price, at the best rate and best quality. And so if you've got most data that you can actually use uh, to make decisions, that's going to give you an advantage over someone who does not. Um, So yeah, so SCADA and not necessarily, you know, Ignition, I think has a good learning platform, but uh, whatever SCADA just be very familiar with how to integrate those systems, not only standalone uh, machines as we've seen in the past. So we've got a next question. Hello guys, thank you for the space. One question, Uh, actually I skipped one of the questions, sorry about that. Uh, What kind of a book do you recommend for us and the best course to take at the moment? So uh, Marcelo, I think uh, Dave kind of mentioned a couple of things that you should be looking at. I think Ignition, if you want to look at Solus PLC, I think Udemy has a lot of different resources as well. In terms of books, um, so we actually have Frank Lam in the comment section on LinkedIn. I believe he wrote a a very extensive book, if not several books. And I think... um, that would be something to uh, to take a look at. To be quite honest with you, I haven't necessarily gone through any books, but the manuals that Rockwell has given me during, uh, you know, the time that I went to uh, to the Rockwell HQ and took their programming course. So I wouldn't necessarily know 
uh, what books would be the best at this time, but uh, there's definitely there's definitely some options if you look on Amazon. If you're if you're specific on PLC or HMI development, there's going to be a couple of books, but I, I I couldn't give you titles at the top of my head like that. I don't know, Dave, if you've got any comments on that question. So I would say kind of a, a lot of it depends um, as to uh, as to what you're looking for. Um, as you mentioned, uh, Frank in the comments has, has certainly written some books uh, and you should check those out. Um, it, I would say that there is a pretty good book. It is fairly expensive of high performance HMI uh, talking about like the theoretical development of HMI screens and kind of getting rid of, you know, a lot of not necessarily color and allowing people to, to better look and understand um, as to what that, uh, as to kind of what, like what an ideal HMI screen can look like. The, the last time I looked, it was more than a hundred dollars on Amazon. Um, but it was, uh, it, it's always looked pretty good. I've read a bunch of ex excerpts from it over the years. I think it's a really good starting point. Uh, for HMI designs, uh, also like SCADA and, and other screens um, along those lines. And then if you're big into like ICS cybersecurity, there are of course, you know, a couple of books there. Uh, Clinton Bodigen and Pascal Ackerman have literally written the two books on, uh, on ICS cybersecurity. And so a, a lot of it is kind of taking a look as to, uh, as to what you want to look at. Um, hmm. There are certainly a lot of, of good options out there if you uh, if you want to look at books. Again, I find that a lot of them seem to get very expensive, I think, because they're generally printed, if you're buying them printed, in low quantities. Yeah, looks like on Amazon, if I got this correctly, the High Performance HMI Handbook, a comprehensive guide to designing, implementing, and maintaining effective HMIs for industrial plant applications, currently $82. Okay. Um, I think that's the ebook edition. Hardcover is 80 on special right now, 39%. So if, if anyone's uh, interested in that, I'm going to post a link on uh, YouTube where this question was asked. And we'll probably put it in the comments. Uh, I mean, in the description once the uh, once the stream is posted. Next, we've got a question. We, oh, we're getting Vlad, a lot. Can, of... can we hold on one sec? Yeah. Frank had just dropped Go a ahead. couple of of book names. So Frank says his is Advanced PLC Hardware and Programming, Siemens and Allen Bradley, and then he also says Tom Mayer um, mm -hmm. and a Tonson's book on structured text. Okay, let me see. Thank you for those, Frank. I may not be able to find all the links. Um, I see actually Frank's book right now on Amazon looks like $43 in uh, paperback. And that's, um, that's again, that's the US price. Of course, if you're somewhere else, that's going to be a little bit different. I'm going to post that link in uh, on YouTube as well if you want to check it out. But um, there's for sure a couple of options. There's... Um, you know, like I, like I was saying, I haven't read them all, so I can't necessarily uh, give a personal recommendation, but there's a lot of uh, decent books out there. And if uh, it is of interest, like I said, I will be posting some other links once uh, once we put up this video. So make yeah, sure we to can check certainly do that. And then before we move on, Vlad, uh, mm -hmm. Seth Johnson on LinkedIn was asking uh, if the CCNA is applicable for in-house control guys who don't need to necessarily take care of large enterprise networks. Um, I can I can take that one. Um, yeah, I, I, that, I would that, say that's certainly a you question. I mean, look, Seth, uh, the, the truth is, is that uh, regardless of what the enterprise network looks like, even if you're in the field and installing a brand new controller, uh, you should be able to configure some of the basic things. Yeah. And again, like that could be just giving it an IP address, a subnet mask and a gateway, but uh, just understanding what those things even mean um, is covered by the CCNA. And I think it's even covered by just the first half of the CCNA. And so to your question, it may not be important to have the certification in itself, as they've uh, had mentioned, the, the important thing is not to just have the paperwork. If you're already 
um, happily employed and work at a facility. But what's important is understanding those topics and understanding how packets are being sent, how you can ping devices, how you can reconfigure your switches. Again, if you're not connected to the enterprise, you're still connected between devices. You still have to set up your switches, the, uh, the Stratic switch that's sitting on top of me here. So that's a managed switch. So you need to be able to recognize some of the keywords once you log on to that switch and you look at the port settings. So that's, it's nothing that's overly complicated, but the CCNA covers the basics of it. And I think, again, just reading through that book that you can buy again on Amazon or from Cisco directly uh, is going to be extremely valuable. And uh, for sure, you're not going to be using all the, all the concepts that are covered in there, but it will... Um, allow you to be a better control systems tech engineer and uh, and what have you. So again, like I guess like my job is more on the on the global engineering side, and I would call my clients and kind of ask, you know, we we're putting in this new processor or even doing an upgrade from a slick 504 to a 505. Can you guys plug this into the switch? And they have almost like no idea what I'm talking about. And that's just a very basic configuration that comes in CCNA. And of course, if you can do it on your own already, then perhaps there's not as much value to uh, for you to have CCNA, but that's something that's important in my eyes, at least. And for you to have the knowledge of those concepts, you'll be an invaluable asset for the plant. No, perfect. And we've also got some other uh, book um ideas rolling through if you guys are watching live or after on stream please feel free to keep dropping those uh we vlad and i will we'll put them together um in we'll, yeah we'll put those books together uh at the end of all of this we've got an interesting question dave i think that's a segue back to um you know careers not that uh, we haven't touched on that but Hey guys, thanks for the space. One question, do you think I can get into maintenance as a technician with a high school degree or should I get an associate's degree in uh, in food and beverage, by the way? So that's uh, very pertinent. What, do you, what are your thoughts, Dave? High school versus associate's degree. So I would say that that's a great question. Um, and before I completely jump onto that, I am actually going to, uh, to shout out Tim Wilborn. Um, I was listening to his first podcast, which is great. He answers a lot of questions for a lot of people kind of learning to get into the industry and increasing their skills. And on the first podcast that he did, he said one of his best suggestions is if you're looking to get experience, go take a job in maintenance because you're going to get a ton of hands-on experience. And then once you have that experience, you're going to be able to get in. So um, I needed to do that. And then on the other side, I would say that it, a lot of it's probably going to be very dependent upon the facility and, uh, and, and where you're currently living. Uh, my best suggestion is to go reach out to the people who are at the, uh, who are at the facility. They're probably going to be able to give you a really strong answer as to if they accept candidates uh, without a diploma, or I guess with just a high school diploma and no advanced degree. Um, beyond that, I would say that if you have the ability and are close to, you know, go to school and get an associate's degree while you're working in the maintenance shift, um, as Vlad kind of mentioned at the beginning of the stream, the stream, that is going to be, you know, your best kind of path forward. You're going to kind of almost future proof yourself if you want to continue, if, if you want to transition your career out of maintenance um, at that food and beverage facility. Yeah, I think that's excellent points. If I may add a few tidbits of um, you know my personal experience, I can tell you that when I was um, when I was hiring into maintenance, so I worked as a maintenance supervisor at a plant for Kraft Heinz in the LA area until that plant unfortunately closed down. And when we were looking for people, whether it is mechanics, um, electricians, or engineers it was always coming down to how much was that person willing to learn versus how much they actually knew. Because we, we, we certainly knew that you could train someone to be a competent mechanic if they at least knew how to work around tools. They weren't obviously completely unexposed to things. But uh, I can tell you that we certainly had people that we hired on board with uh, just a high school degree that were 
not any worse than anyone with an associate's degree. And of course, again, you might have a slightly different learning curve, but um, I don't think that that would stop you from, like I said, becoming some of the top performers in that company. And again, to kind of like maybe bring that back a little bit, I, I think that the best path forward to get your education is through hands-on experience. And if you can combine the two, again, we would do that with certain people is uh, you would work with us, let's say for three to five years, but during that time, you would have two days that you would go to technical school where you would get your associate's degree, but you would still get the hands-on experience and be able to help out quite a bit around the plant during that time. So I think that would be the best opportunity um, and not just you know going two, three years into an associate's degree uh, without any experience, but typically they, I think they do have that component regardless. So to answer your question, I think, it really depends like on where you're at, but I think it's definitely uh, possible to get into maintenance in those jobs with just a high school degree, because I, I've seen it myself happen. I've hired people with just the high school experience. No, perfect. Um, let's see. Do we want to answer more questions? Do we have any other uh highlighted items that we want to hit um on this i know we're running close to uh to the 45 minute uh time um well i think i mean there's still a lot that we can cover when it comes to careers mm -hmm. maybe you know what if we kind of switch it a little bit from the technical side and get your thoughts maybe dave because uh you interact a lot more with uh, that side of things but what about on the business side what about you know, the marketing, the branding, or even, you know, management getting into operations, as opposed to, you know, a technical field, like, what are your thoughts on uh, getting into that, you know, and maybe kind of make it a even more concrete question. Uh, how do you get into operations? Um, can you just, you know, go through operator, then supervisor, then operations manager, like, what are your recommendations on that side of things? So I think a lot of it is dependent upon what you do, which is probably a really terrible answer for most people out there. So let me let me be a little bit more specific. I think that there are a couple of ways that you can go about it. If you want to go into, we'll call it operations at a facility and you start as an operator, kind of at some point you're going to be a shift supervisor, then you might be an area manager. And at some point, you know, you're going to, going to, you are going to continue to get pushed up just by the fact that you're assumably doing a good job and continuing to stay there. Um, if you are looking to make a career change or want to move higher up into the uh, higher up into the organization, that's where you may have to make some decisions. You're going to have to have some conversations. Um, most of the time in a lot of facilities, you know, you've got the operate, you've got the operators and kind of that side, but you also have the engineers that kind of generally sit atop of them. And then you kind of have like the, the, you know, operations team, if you will, that kind of sits over that, that may be some engineers that may be people from the, the plant side, and generally, a lot of that is, you know, looking at what you want to do in the next three to five years and then kind of setting yourself up for that. If you really want to be on that engineering side, figuring out a lot of that, you may have to go back to school to, uh, to get an engineering degree because that is the only way that, uh, th that we can go and, uh, and kind of make that move. I, I would say that almost always those moves are going to be very much planned um, as you're going through the process of doing those. Uh, and and we, we talked a little bit about branding. We talked a little bit about business. Let me give like a really good example, um, specifically on the systems integrator side. We probably have a lot of systems integrators um, oh, oh, who are listening to this, who have considered going and, uh, and be, becoming a systems integrator. And that's kind of the side that I see a much more of a mix of kind of business and marketing and branding and all of those, uh, as you mentioned. Uh, and, you know, honestly, there are a lot of systems integrators and I see that there are a lot of systems integrators because it generally seems like at some point, you know, you go and you take a job at an SI. And if you can put in the hours and put in the work and do 
pretty good. You know, you're going to continue to kind of move up through the ranks because there's a lot of attrition at any large size systems integration company. And then at some point, you know, you're going to be towards the top, maybe you're running a team and you kind of come to the realization of, hey, I'm doing all this work. I'm bringing all this business in. You know, what if I do this for myself? And so I see kind of at that point, a lot of top guys breaking off from systems integration companies kind of making that jump. And, and the reason I bring all that up is because as Vlad mentioned, you know, you, you make the jump into business and marketing and all of that. You know, that's when you're now a business owner, you're an entrepreneur. You now have made the jump into kind of figuring out all of the accounting. You've made the jump to figuring at all of the marketing, all of the branding, if you're going to do that, or who do you bring in to do that? And so a lot of that, um, in my experience, is kind of like a a trial by fire. Uh, And so So me personally, I started out, you know, working some technical jobs. Um, My my bachelor's degree was in business uh, operations and supply chains management. Um, So I I was uh, at one point I was running a supply chain for a relatively small uh, manufacturer's rep distributor. Um, I took a promotion into applications engineering. So I was like completely that technical guy. And at some point it's like, hey, this marketing stuff kind of looks interesting. What if I push myself into a meeting that I shouldn't be and start helping to write a newsletter because I have the technical understanding of what we're talking about. And so then I kind of started writing newsletters and then I started kind of writing newsletters for other people, which kind of led me um, to the path of of being, you know, running a a systems integration company uh, for a period of time. So all of the sales and all of the marketing. And again, a lot of that is is trial by fire and especially for small companies, it's a hey, let's try this. If it works, great. That's fantastic. If, if it doesn't work, let's make a move. Let's try something else. And so it's, it's a lot of being mobile, mobile and agile through this whole process. Yeah, completely uh, agree with you, Dave. And I mean, at the end of the day, as they say, it's a, it's a journey, not a destination, right? And mm-hmm. there's going to be a lot of um, not necessarily always upwards movements in your career. You're always going to jump ladders or figure out like different areas before you can move up to a, uh, you know, maybe more rewarding or higher paying uh, job. So for sure, don't be afraid to, um, to look at different opportunities. Don't be afraid to kind of explore because again, I think manufacturing is such a vast like area. And like you've mentioned, like supply chain, like that's a whole like industry that you could probably spend your entire career in. But at the same time, you know, it's so much to learn and so much to kind of, um, it takes a lot of time to kind of master. There's always this uh, very steep, I find learning curve at the beginning, but once you spend enough time, then uh, you can spend, uh, speak intelligently to the subject. Uh, but um, yeah, I think, uh, I think we want to wrap this up at this point. What are your, what are your, maybe some final thoughts, some final shout outs to some of the people that came and checked out the stream. I certainly want to, you know, thank the, uh, the viewers from YouTube for all the questions that we've received. I think very, uh, very relevant, really appreciate the interaction guys. And hopefully next time it's going to be even, uh, even bigger. Yeah, no, I, I agree, Vlad. Uh, thank you guys, everyone um, who has shown up once again. If you're still listening, uh, please, uh, you know, connect with Vlad and I. Uh, please subscribe to whatever channel you're listening to. I feel like we're podcasters now, so we've got to do that thing where we ask for everyone to give us, you know, five stars on iTunes or Apple Podcast or wh- whatever we're calling it. And by <laughs> saying that, I feel like we're, we're honest to goodness, our real true podcasters um, at this point. But no, uh, so please go ahead and uh, and do all of those things. Uh, thank you to everyone in the community who has uh, who has shown up and continue to show up. Uh, I know. Chris Lukey and Manufacturing Happy Hour. Um, he had uh, he had given us a shout out earlier in the week. Thank you to him and kind of a lot of what he has done to help make manufacturing podcasting a uh, a thing. Right? Like, like yeah, we, we we can say thank you to Chris for uh, helping to make manufacturing podcasting a thing. Um, we we are happy to be here and kind of continue to uh, to share some of our experiences. If anyone is listening to this live. Um, I am planning to actually have a tangential conversation about this uh, with Jordan Humphreys, who is a recruiter. Jordan and I are going to talk at some point um, on Monday 
the uh, the 18th. We're either going to do it at lunchtime or or around the same time. Uh, please feel free to uh, to drop by. We're going to look at job postings and we're going to do it uh, with, through the uh, lens of him as a recruiter and what it means to him and me looking at it as I was, you know, talent looking at a job listing saying, hey, this is uh, th this is what I think it looks like. And then maybe we'll even talk about writing good job listings versus bad job listings. Um, a few final comments. We're getting questions about uh, the uh, your channel. Someone's asking how mm -hmm. to uh, to reach you. I posted the link in the chat on YouTube, but all the links will be ultimately posted once this goes live on the YouTube page. It's going to be in the description underneath. And then someone said, thank you for the advice. I've learned a ton. Keep up the great work. And then... Uh, Vlad and Dave, when will be the next live podcast? So we're going to be announcing that date uh, closer to the date again. We don't have a very solid schedule yet. And I think that's something me and Dave really need to uh, work yeah. out between the two of us. But we will have something a lot more consistent. But typically, we've um, I think we've discussed it. And it's going to be once every two weeks or so mm -hmm. to a month. But we're, we're going to... Uh, like I said, release the uh, the next podcast before it comes in. So really appreciate the support. And um, like I said, we'll share all the links in the appropriate media and hope to see you guys next time. Yes, perfect. Thank you, everyone. We'll, uh, we'll talk to you guys soon. Take care.